For centuries, in communities all over the world, we have lived in harmony with nature. Today, this harmony is threatened. Increasing population, the growth of towns and cities, and widespread pollution make us feel that we are no longer a part of the natural world. Forests and rivers, mountains and seashore have given us the space in which to relax, play, enjoy the wonders of wildlife, and to have a sense of unity with nature. Today, these open spaces are being provided by an increasing number of parks and nature reserves. Rapid population growth in the second half of the 20th century led many people to realize the need to conserve wildlife and to retain part of the countryside for recreational use. Now, 40% of Hong Kong is made up of country parks. They are managed by the Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department. For us, the parks are places in which to enjoy ourselves and breathe clean, fresh air. For birds, animals and plants, they are home, the source of their food and shelter, and so we should treat them with respect. During summer, typhoons and storms bring the rains needed to fill our reservoirs and water the land. But they also bring powerful winds and floods, which uproot and destroy many trees. In the country parks, the loss of trees is being partly made up by an afforestation program. Over a half million trees are planted every year. The Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department supplies native tree seeds to schools. The children grow their own trees from the seeds, caring for them until they're ready for planting. The department's staff make occasional visits to check progress. Perhaps one day these children will walk in the shade of the trees they've helped to grow. Children and adults often take part in tree planting events in the country parks. Such activities are very popular and give practical hands-on experience in nature conservation. Since 1997, more than half the trees planted have been native species. This will encourage a truly local natural environment. Fire is the greatest threat to the country parks. The fire season, which may last as long as six months, occurs in the cooler and drier winter weather during this time, fire control teams are on permanent standby. In an average season, there might be up to seven fires a day. Actually, I
Often, fires are caused by the deliberate burning of vegetation to clear farmland. But they can also result from carelessness by lighting campfires or barbecues in areas where they're not allowed. This is illegal. Afforestation areas, which may have taken years to grow, can be wiped out in hours. Fires turn beautiful landscapes into ugly ones. Worse, they destroy woodland, which is home to half our inland birds. To them, loss of woodland means loss of food, shelter, and nesting sites. Over 100 species of birds have been recorded as breeding in Hong Kong. Nesting boxes of different shapes and sizes have been provided to encourage nesting by established inland birds and to attract new ones. With the assistance of the Hong Kong Bird Watching Society, monitoring is carried out to ensure that the boxes are not damaged. But some birds, like the Baya Weaver, still prefer to build their own nests. In the Northwest New Territories, Maipo Marshes and Inner Deep Bay have for many years been a refuge and a feeding ground for migratory birds. It consists mainly of mud flats, reed beds, fish ponds, and one of the largest mangrove forests along the coast of China. In 1976, the area was designated a site of special scientific interest. Nowadays, it is a center for conservation and education. In 1995, it became a wetland of international importance under the terms of the Ramsar Convention, an international agreement to preserve the world's outstanding wetlands. This means that we are obliged to protect Maipo and Inner Deep Bay from destruction or reclamation. To qualify as a Ramsar site, the area must be a good example of a natural or near natural wetland. It must support a large number of rare or endangered species of plants, birds or animals. It must hold at least 20,000 water birds and at least 1% of the world population of one species of water bird. Maipo lies on the East Asian, Australasian flyway for migratory shorebirds, and at least 13 endangered species can be seen there. In addition to birds, more than 17 species of marine creatures previously unknown to scientists have been found. In order to protect the wildlife, the wetland is a restricted area, and this makes it a regular wintering ground for migratory birds. In a record year, 68,000 birds were counted. Wardens patrol the wetland to prevent illegal activities, such as unlawful trapping, willful disturbance, and possession of any wild animals or birds. As part of its work in education and conservation, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, subvented by the government, organizes school visits to the waterfowl collection area. Staff are on hand to guide, inform, and explain, and so give the children a memorable day out. Of all the water birds that visit my pole, one of the rarest is the critically endangered black-faced spoonbill. In the whole world, there are only about 700. And of these, about 170 spend the winter at Maipo. The black-faced spoonbill only occurs in East Asia. Its main breeding area is on several islands near the west coast of the Korean Peninsula. Children on a school visit learn that the spoonbill is a very shy bird 
and that to find out more about them, some birds were fitted with satellite transmitters. The resulting information, accessible on the internet, showed the spoonbill's migration routes between Korea and Maipo, and the stopping off places the birds most preferred. At Kaduri Farm and Botanic Garden, the Wild Animal Rescue Center was established in 1996. It provides treatment for sick and injured wildlife and animals rescued from illegal wildlife traders. It also acts as an official reception center for birds and animals that have been seized by the government from illegal captivity, many of which may be suffering from neglect and ill treatment. The rescue center has a fully equipped on-site veterinary hospital run by highly qualified staff. This collared scops owl has been hurt by flying into a closed window. It is examined thoroughly for broken bones, feather damage, or internal injury. As with all birds and animals brought to the hospital, it receives the very best attention. The staff at the hospital have to deal with a range of medical problems. Besides birds, they often have to deal with monkeys and large reptiles, which if they cannot be released, may be given shelter in the mammal and reptile sanctuaries. There is also a raptor sanctuary for native birds of prey such as owls and kites. This is a great favorite with visitors. The rescue center has an area specially set aside for birds and animals that need time to recover from medical treatment or surgery. Here they are fed and cared for and kept under observation to check their progress to full recovery. Whether bird, mammal or reptile, the rescue center's aim is always the same, to treat the animal and wherever possible release it back to the wild. Of the 450 species of birds recorded in Hong Kong, many are woodland or scrubland inhabitants, providing visitors who venture beyond the picnic sites with a delightful variety of sights and sounds. We are still amazingly rich in wildlife, but numbers are declining. Some species are very rare and hard to find, especially those which only move about by night. Such animals are extremely sensitive to the sight, sound and smell of human beings. To observe them, cameras are set up and left unattended for many weeks. These researchers are looking for a site to install an infrared camera. A pathway likely to be used by animals is located. Infrared beam equipment is put up to cross the pathway. Any animal passing through the beam will cause the camera shutter to operate. In this way, rarely seen animals will be photographed, such as porcupine pangolin, barking deer, and the javan mongoose. Many species are vanishing, but to the quiet and observant visitor, there is still much to enchant the eye. We are home to 2,800 plant species, both native and introduced, and some of them are now extremely rare. Conservation programs are going ahead that will restore plants that have been lost due to development. These programs contribute to the greening and beautifying of our landscape.
Ecologist Michael Lau is a recognized expert on reptiles and amphibians, of which Hong Kong has over 100 different species. A significant part of his research is concerned with turtles. Turtles are elusive creatures, and their popularity as a source of medicine makes them a target for trappers. Michael demonstrates the way a turtle trap works to a group of wardens whose job is to enforce the wild animal's protection ordinance. This is a strict law, and so it should be. It forbids hunting or even disturbing any wild animal or bird. It is an offense to be in possession of hunting equipment, and setting traps and digging pits is absolutely forbidden. Using a metal detector, the wardens search for turtle traps. The law enforcement activities of wardens in the country parks are wide-ranging and include prosecuting anyone found littering, damaging facilities, or lighting fires outside barbecue areas. The wardens have found a trapped turtle. They set it free, returning it to the wild. Also under threat is the green sea turtle. Wardens patrol Shamwan Beach, which is designated a restricted area under the Wild Animals Protection Ordinance during the turtle's nesting period. Marine parks and marine reserves are by their very nature spectacularly beautiful places. Fortunately, much of our shoreline is unspoiled, but danger threatens sewage, dredging, dumping, reclamation, and the scandalous use of explosives for fishing. Not all the news about our wildlife is bad. Here is a sight to gladden anyone's heart. A school of Chinese white dolphins. These dolphins are unique to Hong Kong. They are found mainly in the waters to the west of the territory. This is because they prefer the freshwater environment of river estuaries, such as the Pearl River. They are friendly creatures whose playful group behavior is much enjoyed by visitors on boat tours. As well as enjoyment, the tours have an educational purpose. Marine Park staff provide information on the dolphins' habits and breeding patterns to ensure that visitors understand the need for dolphin protection. The good news is that our dolphin population of around 1,000 shows no signs of any decrease. The bad news is that wildlife exists under a permanent threat from unthinking people, and that means us. We have to think of ourselves as being a part of nature and wildlife, and not above it. Perhaps then, we will respect and take care of our environment. In the marine parks, enforcement patrols check the fishing permits of local villagers and fishermen. They keep watch on oil barges for pollution and monitor the quality of the park's water. But wardens and enforcement patrols cannot do everything. We have to make our contribution. We have to be aware of the dangers that threaten what remains of our wild heritage. Even taking part in a beach cleanup can produce in a small way that sense of being a part of nature, which is the chief joy of country and marine parks. Country and marine park staff are trained in all aspects of caring for the environment. 
the visiting lecturer can supply them with additional facts on the care of mangrove forests. But he doesn't need to lecture them about their responsibilities. They know them already. Organized school visits to the marine parks are just one feature of ongoing schemes of education, conservation and recreation conducted by the Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department. The visits are part of a campaign to promote realistic understanding of nature with hands-on community participation. We can help by involving ourselves in the wildlife around us and exploring its wonders. In this way, we will come to understand its value and with understanding will come respect and love. In the marine parks, the seashore is life in miniature, an amazing display of colors and patterns and busy activity. The least we can do to preserve it is to leave it clean and not take away any shells or creatures that live there. We have to give back to nature what we have taken from it. A good example is artificial reefs made of car tires, barges and boats, sunk onto the seabed to provide a new home for marine life. are a way of making up for years of pollution, coastal reclamation, overfishing, and fishing by destructive means. In this newly made underwater world, marine animals are populating the structures, coral is growing, and fish are breeding. Many more of these reefs are planned all around Hong Kong's coastline to bring back life to underwater wastelands. This wonderland is an example of what can be achieved by treating nature with respect and with love. Today, there is a growing realization of how valuable our wildlife is to us, and a feeling that natural resources are there to be managed and looked after, not robbed and destroyed. The country and marine parks show how conservation areas can exist and succeed side by side with a densely populated modern city. The wild birds and animals, fish and plants and trees have been given living space. Now it is up to us to do all we can to extend care for nature and wildlife beyond the borders of the country parks and into the whole of Hong Kong. But the pressures of population and urban growth are increasing. The world of nature is fragile. Caring for it must be a part of our daily life. Their future is in your hands. <laughs> 